the, uh, the background to the work that I'd like to present to you and, and to, ask, uh, to ask you to help me with uh, is I've been thinking about, I had been thinking about uh, the types of, um, well, the confessional malleability, mobility that, that uh, Ronnie Shah spoke about on the first evening. Uh, we know from Chaim Hillel ben Sasson's classical work on the Jews in the eyes of the Reformation, we know of certain uh, classic Jewish responses to the turmoil within Christendom. But uh, going beyond what, what he and a few other people have written about, I think that the, um, the prominence of, of old Christians in Portugal, in Amsterdam, in Germany, in Poland, um, those are in France, in Italy, who are adopting new ways of being Christian, many of which look quite Judaistic, whether they're anti-Trinitarians, whether they're Anabaptists of the Josephite, uh, strain who actually held at, a, at one of their uh, conventions in Venice in the 15th century that um, the passages pertaining to that, that Joseph was truly the father of Jesus and who wanted to excise from the New Testament passages that suggested otherwise. Um, what impact does this make on Jews? I mean, to what extent are Jews aware of all this? And uh, because I believe they were very aware of it, um, what, what kind of response? How does this play in the Jewish camp? Having Having set that in the background, I now want to turn to uh, a what will ultimately become a related set of issues. Um, so it's sort of a new, new page. When I did my um, study of, of a pseudonymous critique of rabbinic culture uh, called Sachal, uh, I, I discovered, to my surprise, and it was you know I was lucky that I did find some key that helped me understand it better than I had understood it when I initially read it. And the key was that every single critique of some aspect of some feature, legal feature of Jewish law that was criticized in this text, every single critique was drawn from within the, what we could call the rabbinic archive. That is to say, if there was a critique of, of one particular uh, aspect of, of, of Jewish law, it came from either the Talmud it came from biblical exegesis, it came from grammatical treatises. In other words, in this case, the philological work really provided me with some sense of how this author was operating. He was attacking rabbinic culture from within using its own language. And I would say and have said that in some ways, Kol Sachal is uh, perhaps a historically insignificant in, in as much as it had no impact, but it, uh, it, but it, it still represents something along the lines of what, uh, say, Amos Funkenstein has shown us in um, theology and the scientific imagination. That is to say, how concepts, how terms are revalued over time so that cultural and social transformations happen in an evolutionary manner rather than a revolutionary one. Okay, the one problem I came across in Kol Sachal, there was one passage that I could never really understand. I could not understand where the, and I always refer to it by the name of the book rather than by its hidden author, whom I believe to be Yehuda Arye Modena, because I don't think this really represents Yehuda, Mar uh, I'm not making the claim that this is what he really wanted to say. I have a more nuanced way of putting it, so let's just call it Kol Sachal, the author. I did not understand how he could claim, and here I'm about five lines down on the second page, this is his recommendations for how conversion should take place. By this I mean that they, the rabbis, ought to have explained regarding one who comes to convert that after warning him and after the investigation, by which it is made clear to us that his coming is for the sake of heaven and not for some external purpose, he should be informed of the virtue of circumcision and its reward if he wishes to circumcise himself well and good, and if not, let him immerse himself and become a Jew. And this will be sufficient for him to participate in testimony, in marriage, inheritance, and bequest, and everything else like the rest of the Jewish people. 
Well, you know, I searched and searched uh, whatever sources I could get my hands on. I could not find any way that this claim could really was echoing something that had been said in earlier Jewish sources, and yet I was quite convinced and continue to be convinced that that method is the key to understanding how the author proceeded. So I was, I just had to, that was really, uh, it, it was something that I was left not understanding, and it was rather important that I didn't understand. I mean, it, it was crucial because the whole reason that Kosakal's author claims to be writing this treatise is because he sees that in the world around him, which is primarily monotheistic, Christians and Muslims um, have been very much attracted to the Torah of Moses, and yet alienated by its rabbinic uh, interpretation. And so he feels that if, if the Messiah is ever going to come, says the author in the introduction to the book, um, perhaps, he doesn't say quite this clearly, but really if the Jews could somehow return to the Torah of Moses, then um, everybody could kiss and be friends, and the Messiah would come. And then in the third part of the treatise, he then spells out what does he mean by returning to the Torah of Moses. I'm, I'm interpolating too much into, because he doesn't say anything quite this clearly, but this is my paraphrase that's uh, embellished. Okay, they, meaning the rabbis, would already have some support for this lenient position, namely that it's okay for a male convert to Judaism merely to undergo immersion and not to undergo circumcision. They would already have support for this, some support for this lenient position in the Torah for a resident alien, a ger toshav, that's a biblical term, was not required to circumcise himself and it was not an impediment for him except with regard to the eating of the paschal sacrifice and nothing else. Okay. The, the category of Ger Toshav, technically speaking, only applies in a time when, when um, the Jewish people are, are a majority in their land, and I've forgotten the rest of the halachic categories, but it didn't apply either in early 17th century Venice, when Yehuda Aryeh Modena was writing, nor did it apply in 1505 in Alcala, when the, uh, re, the uh, purported uh, author of Kol Sachal claims to have been writing in Shnat Haras. You can draw your own conclusions. Okay, so, you know, Ger Toshav is really a red herring. The notion of a resident alien is very strange. Okay. La and then the last paragraph, this would have made it this if only we Jews, the only we r rabbinic Jews would omit the requirement of circumcision for potential converts. This would have made it easier for the nations, enabling them to enter under the wings of the divine presence or to assume the yoke of our Torah. Okay, it li kanes mitachat lekanfei hashchina, oh, the kabel. It's all HaTorah, you can look at it, but there's, there's a definitely or there. If it was, were most easy and pleasant, but always according to what was commanded by Moses, man of the Lord. And perhaps an entire nation and kingdom would already have become Jews, or more than one, meaning uh, more than one kingdom, not more than one nation of Jews, right? And, and our redemption would draw near, as I've hinted to you in the second essay, etc. Et okay, so this was the mystery that I have been bearing for a while. And then uh, other research that I did brought me into to something that I think helps to explain what's going on in the Kol Sachal passage and that perhaps ultimately ties up with the subject that I raised at first, namely, were Jews actively, in, the early, in early modern Europe, actively involved in abetting the conversion of old Christians who wished to become Jews? Okay, old Christians. Um, the Portuguese Jesuit Antonio Vieira makes this claim in 1640, makes the claim that there's an underground Jewish proselytizing movement. Um, Josef Kaplan, uh, in his article about the reception of, uh, of Gerim in Amsterdam, refers to a number of cases in which certain old Christians appear in Amsterdam um, the Jewish community in Amsterdam does not want to receive them and to convert them, and they send them on to Germany or Poland. I mean, I'm, I, I could also throw out names, some of which um, Ronnie Shaw mentioned, but there are some very well-known, you know, humanists. And I mean, Jean Baudin has a very complicated story, and Guillaume Postel has a very complicated story, and Lipsius has a very complicated story. There are people who 
who who are writers. I mean, there are people who are men of letters who whose some of whose writings would presumably have been known by Jewish men of letters who certainly existed in Italy at the time and in, perhaps in Amsterdam. So something's going on here. I've also, I mean, there are a few other references that I've picked up along the way. All I really want to concentrate on now is can we find any internal Jewish evidence of a textual sort that suggests that Jews are actively playing with or cons playing with this this particular topic. I, I'll give one reference to something that I, I wrote a piece for the Modena. There's a, um, a book called Leone Sh 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 Lion The Lion Roars. It's partly in Hebrew, partly in English. Yes, Yishagr Shoeg. Anyway, edited by David Malki, and I wrote a piece there that looks at Magen Vacherov, which is a, a Yehuda Arye Modena's um, anti-Christian polemic, and I ask questions about why is he bending over backwards to make Christianity theologically non-idolatrous and palatable to Jews. This is, goes well beyond the, the um, embrace of Jesus as a good Jew, which is already apparent in the 12th century and beyond that, in which one can read about once Ram Ben Shalom writes his terrific, uh, publishes his terrific dissertation. But it's also, you can read about this in some of David Berger's stuff. There's a, a real, a, a very confusing um, perspective on Christianity. On the one hand, it's an anti-Christian polemic. On the other hand, he is whitewashing it. He is making it palatable to Jews. This is what I would say about Magen Vacherov. Okay, now let's jump to, this is Arobio de Castro. Um, I am awaiting the, the Spanish manuscript, which I haven't yet gotten from Amsterdam, but um, here we find the same, just, Arobio de Castro is, is a little later than uh, Leone Modena. Um, so too the covenant between God and the seed of Abraham and the children of Israel will last forever. He's writing this to a, to a Christian. And the Gentiles who recognized the God of truth and worshiped him will be gerim, proselytes, converts in Israel, and beloved of God. But they will never become Israel or the seed of Abraham. For Israel is not a spiritual entity, but rather a nation for better or worse. Okay. Um, you know, if Kol Sachal, who's writing under, that's a, written under cover of pseudonym, is welcoming conversion, clearly, Robio de Castro is saying, sure, you can get closer to God, but you can never become one of us. I, I find similar things in Menashe ben Israel and a few other of the Portuguese rabbis of the 16th and 17th centuries, where they have this distinction between the seed of Israel, it's a biological, yes, I hear race in there, anybody want to know if I heard it there? Um, uh, it's a biological, uh, and of course we have to think about the role that race plays in Iberian, the Iberian culture, which they've all imbibed. Um, but this is there's a distinction between becoming a convert and ever becoming one of the seed of Israel. Okay, um, moving on. I'm, I think you'll see where, what I'm building to. This next passage, which is from Tzemach ben Shlomo Duran, Sheilot Uchuvot Yachin Uvoaz. Uh, Tzemach ben Shlomo Duran was one of the famous, did you used to say Duran Duran family? Wasn't you? No. Uh, the, the Duran family of Algiers wrote beginning in the 15th century following the, the events in the Iberian Peninsula of 1391. So in the 15th and the 16th century, you have three generations of Duran rabbis uh, who write an array of works, and you'll see selections from two of these works. This is um, a legal work, and uh, what characterizes, I mean, there are many things that characterize them, but a thread that runs through the writings of all three generations is the the need, the desire, and the ability, or at least the, the technical expertise at um, uh, rendering conversos fully Jewish for the legal purposes that are needed, whether it's purposes of inheritance, uh, divorce, um, right? In, in other words, when you, ha you have a situation where a, a conversa or a conversa who, who has come out of the Iberian Peninsula or may still be in the Iberian Peninsula and is related to somebody outside who's been communicating with the rabbi, 
all sorts of questions having to do with personal status in Jewish law in which, you know, the question is ultimately, is this person a Jew or is this person an idolater? And the Duran family very, uh, very interestingly work out ways, and it's the rhetoric that you can really see in, in the passage that I've selected, you, you see how, how cleverly they, um, they manage to explain how this enigma, how this, this strange uh, hybrid, and I realize I'm going into that racial language again, um, how, how we can clearly see that this is a Jew and not an idolater. Um, Anybody who's interested in this, um, Moshe Orfali, I think the colleague of some of you here uh, wrote a, a, the introduction to his book, has a very nice um, piece on this. I mean, his his Abu Ab book, right, right. Okay, so this is this is the part where I really began to uh, salivate. Okay, here's a. Um, uh, this, this rabbi has received a letter from a rabbi in Fez asking regarding the question, uh, regarding what should be done in Fez. A whole bunch of conversos have settled in Fez, um, and a lot of them, it seems, claim to be kohanim. They claim to be of priestly descent, which would, uh, among other things, entitle them to, the, to be honored with uh, by being called up to the Torah for the first blessing. And this rabbi and his colleagues who have written uh, Rabbi Duran from Fez is not so sure that these people really are, you know, are they really Kohanim? So let's, this, I'd like to read the answer. Okay. Fez to the learned Rabbi Nathan Busti and his colleagues, may the rock preserve and keep them. You asked, my brothers, regarding one who came and claimed that he was a Kohen, whether or not one can believe him for calling him first to read from the Torah. Answer, dot, dot, dot. Okay, the first point he makes, well, the first point that I've extracted that he makes is that most conversos really are Jews because they have their own social stigma that that community tends not to marry out. It, it's their own mode of, of internal social coercion. So if, if they're, you know, if they're accepted, if they accept one another as Jews, they're Jews. So don't even go messing there. Next, next uh, point. This is um, close below the bottom, I mean below the half line. I will now return and respond to your words in which you wrote ruling invalidation of the priesthood for those of the Anusim, right, the coerced ones, who come and claim that they are held to be Kohanim, priests. Now here we have a quote from the questioner. First you wrote using these words. Regarding the matter of these gerim, and I left it untranslated on purpose, okay, gerim proselytes or converts, regarding the matter of these gerim who, came, who come from the kingdoms of Catalan and Castile and Portugal to convert, lehit gayer, and to enter under the wings of the divine presence, and each one of them says that I am a Kohen, etc. And this is the gist of your language, says the respondent. The respondent goes on, one who examines your words will find in them a great error. For God forbid that Jews in all their places of residence would be stupid enough to call up first to the Torah for the Kohen's portion, one who was an idolater and converted. Right? In other words, have a little faith in the people of Israel. This is, seems to be the, the thrust of, of what he's saying is, you know, nobody's stupid enough to call up you. Okay, let me go on. And an idolater, right, if a person had been a Christian and then became a convert to Judaism, and an idolater who converts can never claim and say that he's a Kohen, for where would this priesthood of his have come from? Right, if you're not, this, if you're not the son of a Kohen, you can never be a Kohen. So it's totally, it's, it's uh, 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 totally unlikely, it could never happen, that a convert from Christianity would ever claim to be a priest since it's a, a, a matter of lineage. Right. Um, that's the first point. Here we're, now we're getting into the issue of Gerim. You must catch, and I think he says Tiktos Bayad or something like that, Bayad Tiktosu. You must catch that these conversos are not called by the term Gerim converts, for they are Tola'at Yaakov. They are the worm of Jacob. They are considered maggots of Israel and are not called Gerim for this purpose, but rather Ba'alei Tshuva, penitents. Right. Do not call the conversos gerim. 
And we have learned that they, the Talmudic sages, only used the term ger for one who was an idolater and entered under the wings of the divine presence and took upon himself the entire Torah. And someone who accepted the seven Noahide commandments and agreed not to practice idolatry is called a resident alien. Okay, we're back to that same term, ger toshav. A ger toshav, I only told you half of it, or even less than that. A ger toshav was, a, was the term applied to um, Israelite wannabes in, in biblical times, those who hung out with the Israelites as they moved from encampment to encampment, and who were permitted to partake of that, were part of that society with respect to everything but um, partaking of the Paschal sacrifice. That's what we know from biblical times. Once we get into the rabbinic understanding of Ger Toshav, we find this um, melding, conflation of the seven Noahide laws with the Ger Toshav. It is retrojected back onto the biblical Israelites that they abided by the, the uh, six, by the seven, six negative, the six prohibitions, uh, I'm not going to remember all of them, and, and the injunction to establish courts of justice. Okay, so adding to that the um, the idea that, I mean, the prohibition of blasphemy is one of them, and somehow that gets morphed with prohibition of idolatry, and the rabbis thereupon understand that the Gere Toshav of biblical times are those who are observers of the, of the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, the seven Noahide laws. Sorry, that was a footnote. Okay. Um, all right. Point being, the, the conversos are not gerim, and they are not gere toshav either. Okay, next, uh, last paragraph on that page. I also see these words of yours as incorrect, and there is nothing in these claims that would invalidate the offspring from the status of priesthood. For we have not found that one who is born of uncircumcision, Misha no lad min ha is unfit to be a Kohen, a priest, right? So even if the person wasn't circumcised, it still should not be, or the son of a person who wasn't circumcised, that should not invalidate his status as a Kohen. Does that mean you will be born of uncircumcision in non-Jew? No, 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 converso, converso. Because if he's of an idolater, forget it, you can't ever be a Kohen. Because you're, because you, you know, reminds me of that bad joke. We have a dinner. The joke that you're thinking? I know that joke, okay. Sorry, I don't have a joke, but, uh, but I think in this case, more literal Please. Uh, translation is more appropriate. Yeah. One, I would say, who is born in life through a foreskin. Born of the foreskin. Okay, so that's fine. Right, I sound too Pauline already, don't I? I'm, I'm jumping the gun. Okay, that's good. Thank you. All right, uh, so even if, the fa even if the converso father of the returned, uh, of, the, of this person now resident in Fez, was not circumcised, still it's a, his, his kahuna, his priest, claim to the priesthood is not challenged. Okay, this is also because, and here's where it was uh, really great to use my Kosovsky or whatever it was that I used. I mean, this is where philology pays off. This is because Israelites, although uncircumcised, are called circumcised. And even though the uncircumcised one violates the law regarding one who does not circumcise himself, still his offspring is ritually valid for marriage to a Jew and for priesthood. And he is regarded as one who is circumcised, as they say, oh, I guess I didn't need, I guess it gave me my reference. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, as they say in chapter Hanoder in Tractate Nidarim, one who vows not to benefit from the uncircumcised is forbidden to benefit from the circumcised of the nations of the world. Okay, let me, I'm going to contextualize this in a second. And is permitted to benefit from the uncircumcised of Israel. For an idolater, even if circumcised, is called uncircumcised. And an Israelite, even if uncircumcised, is called circumcised. As it is said, Jeremiah 9.25, for all the Gentiles are uncircumcised and the Jews are uncircumcised of heart. This is, somehow in Hebrew it's a little bit easier, but it's, it ain't so easy anyway. What I have brought several pages hence is the, is the passage from the Mishnah that is being cited. 
Um, I'm thinking again of, of certain things that came up both in, in Adam's presentation when we talked about how could there be both a Jew who holds, somebody who holds mortgage on a land and yet doesn't have to go into the army. You know, something that seems to be, um, you know, kind of, kind of a, a confusion of categories and also in, in, in Ronnie Shah's talk, you know, again, these ambiguities that normally you don't find such ambiguity of status and you want your categories clean. I mean, is it okay for um, a particular uh, convert to Christianity to still refrain from eating pork even if he accepts Jesus? Or is that does that still leave him in the category of not having been a full convert? We're, we're dealing, in the case of the Mishnah, in this particular, it's actually a great, um, I found it to be a very great parak, a very great chapter uh, as I went through it. Uh, um, the, the concerns have to do with hybrid designations because when it comes to taking oaths, which is the, the, the theme of this tractate, uh, if a person takes an oath that's an ambiguous, it, that's an ambiguous one or that refers to um, that uses terms that are le that lend themselves to multiple interpretations. If it's going to have any legal status, you have to know how to cut the oath. I mean, how to parse it. What does it actually refer to? And so there's a whole list of uh, terms that are lend them open themselves to ambiguity, and some which I might not have thought were ambiguous in the first place. And this is where the passage that uh, again, I mean, think how hard Tzemach. Uh, Ben Shlomo Duran had to work to, to think of a way of getting, of, of validating the, the, um, the Jewishness of, of, an, the, of an uncircumcised converso. But he had something quite wonderful here, which, does not, which comes in a, it's in a legal context, but I think really what we're talking about is it's, it's an exercise in logic. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm open to your readings of this, and I'm, I'll. This is. Um, exercise in rhetoric. Exercise in rhetoric. Fair. Okay. Good. All right. Um, in the Hebrew, you actually have the entire list of, of at least this particular Mishnah number eleven, and I've started you in the middle in in the English. So it's sort of unfair because uh, some of the other ones are are interesting as well. Well. Um, if one, if he said, if one said, if one taking an oath said, Konam, you know, may, may this and this happen to me, or may this and this not happen to me, if I derive benefit from, that's the name, that's the formula of the oath. So, I'm starting from the English. If he said, Konam, if I derive benefit from the uncircumcised, he is permitted to derive benefit from uncircumcised Israelites. By prohibit, which is, of course, notice that the Tana, at least hypothetically, can imagine in his abstract, wildest dreams that there could be such a thing as an uncircumcised Israelite. Of course, we know that, right, I was going to say that, that you know, anybody who has a you know, hemophiliacs, I'm sorry? Two older brothers. Okay, so hemophiliacs are exempted, you know, or the, I should say, one who is a, a, a male child born to a family in which there are no hemophiliacs is exempted from circumcision for obvious reason, the presumption being that, that you know, hemophilia runs in the family and you don't want to put the child at, at risk. Okay, so fine, I, that's also good. Um, but prohibited from deriving benefit from circumcised Gentiles. Okay, um, I'm trying to, th you know, Roman historians, uh, we're talking, you know, second century here, third century here, uh, there could be some circumcised Gentiles around, question mark? I mean, I don't, I don't know, I'm interested. I mean, as an anthropologist. Yeah. I would think that generally if you're talking about broad part of the world at any given time, the assumption would be that certain people. Are, yeah. Okay, okay. Conum, con, thank you. Con, I'm sorry. Egyptian. Egyptian. Well, that's isn't that much. That was maybe, maybe in the maybe per, persistent. Okay, okay. Conum, if I derive benefit from the circumcised, he is prohibited to derive benefit from uncircumcised Israelites and permitted to derive benefit from circumcised Gentiles. So, crossing categories all across the line here. For the word, but this is the point that is relevant. For the word arel, uncircumcised, is used only as a name for Gentiles. As it is written, and there's that 
quote from Jeremiah, for all the nations are uncircumcised, and the rest of the verse doesn't really work, right? <laughs> and the whole of the house of Israel is, is not, not relevant to the point he's making. Okay? Um, so having, you know, the Mishnah, for its own reasons, is making the claim that an uns that the term uncircumcised can only refer to non-Jews. So even if there is an uncircumcised Jew, it's still, it doesn't, he doesn't fit into the category with all the applicable rules that normally apply to an arel, to an uncircumcised one. And we see how uh, Tzemach ben Shlomo Duran uses that in order, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rhetorical flourish, but he uses that in order to say, in answering with some anger, this rabbi from Fez who has, you know, who doubts the Jewishness of an uncircumcised priest or the, the son of an uncircumcised priest. Uh, I want to say a few things about that, but I think the rhetorical flourish and anger are, are completely in place. Namely, he realizes that the person to whom he's writing is more or less an idiot, which I mean, uh, it's clear that according to his special uh, categories, uh, the son of the coin is the coin, rather than whether that coin has circumcision or anything. That's clear. What I do think applies here, and it's a little bit like what we had earlier, with, what Ted mentioned earlier about uh, children from menstruation. I'm sure on some level of popular religion among Moranos or New Christians there was this notion that if you were conceived by an uncircumcised phallus, then uh, there was something not quite right about you. Uh, and that perhaps you could be a Jew, but not going. And that's purely popular religion. Okay, well, I, I just want, the only thing I would perhaps suggest modifying is that th this would not have been prevalent, you said, among conversos, I would say, in the communities to which conversos returned. Right, whatever. Okay. Know, just point, it's a popular, it's a notion of Fine. popular religion. But here's a rabbi, this classic instance, where a learning rabbi is replying to a rabbi who is right, fair. Pop, pop, part of that popular conception. Okay. So what he does then is that he says, obviously, this person is going, no doubt about it. And then he goes on, and this is the rhetoric plus. All he does is he uses the Mishnah and Dari, and the Dari is, actually, is involved in what we would be kind of called ordinary language philosophy. Namely, when you use the word uncircumcised, you mean it literally, or do you mean it uh, somewhat figuratively, meaning uh, biologically, or that one the same way when you use the word blacks, you mean people with black skin, or do you mean it and stuff? What about is? No, I'm just. Okay. Uh, so that, well, so all the rabbis did there was saying when in our day and age somebody takes an oath and uses the word uncircumcised, he is he makes it in, this, in, in, in the uh, ethnic sense rather than the character. You know. So what? Um, that, this is a perfect example of what Chaim Soloveitchik did often in his book on Shiloh's Shabbat Machori story, namely with the author of the responsum is. Uh, tech, putting in some rabbinic quotes to dress it up as, as a, a learned response, and where basically the, it's a two answer thing, you idiot, of course, you do. Well, that, I, I'm. Well, okay, sorry, you idiot, of course, you do. So that there is this. Uh, you know, he ha he maybe this, maybe you're that's right. That's why I'm saying it's rhetorical. He doesn't. Okay. The logic is simply that whether you're circumcised or not has no effect on whether you're someone you go in. But he uses, he throws in the Michelin to make it. Okay, I, I, will, I will say that he makes the same argument in it, one other chuba, the one that I left out, because I realized I could get another, you know, it's, it recurs in his chuvot, but I, I probably wouldn't, um, because there are so many other really creative strategies that are used by the Duran rabbis in order to uh, halachically justify. See, I mean, you, I think I understand what you're saying with respect to, you know, the son of a Kohen is a Kohen, but the claim that a converso is a Jew is less transparent right, that's to me. The entire response, but only that last passage. But the last yeah, passage right. doesn't refer to Kuhuna, and that's why I say this is more a strategy to, that is to say, you know, an Arel. A Jew is, can never be called an arel. He's making a, um, 
a, a, talk, a claim about nomenclature that doesn't have to do with the kuhuna here, and that's why I'm saying I think it, it's being used as a halacha, as a strategy of legitimation that's more than, you know, you, uh, you know, pushing, you know, kind of just knocking off a, a dummy. The distinction between the left, between the left argument, left argument is two, 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 two words, namely, with the other person's going, because right. the okay. then, then we're on. Right. Okay. Then we're on. Pleasure has nothing to do with it. Right. It's, you get the same question unless you vote. But the latter isn't rhetoric. That's what I'm saying. It's not. I think it's not just rhetoric. It's not. Right. In the same way, you say if his, if his mother was was impure at the time of conception, is he cocaine or, or not? Okay. So you could so you could uh, you know write some long lengthy treatise about about this, but the answer is of course you. So, but instead of writing, okay. you see what I'm saying? I I, I do. I, before I get to Yossi, I, I I do see what you're saying about the cocaine, but the question of whether a converso was a Jew was truly up for grabs. Right. Okay. So I'm, fine. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, all right. The last, the last part of the oh, okay. Sorry. Well, first of all, this is a scholar from a Muslim country. It's very different uh, terminology used in a Muslim country than in a Christian country. For Muslims, the Jew in a Muslim country, Arel, is only Christian. And they use it, you will never find a expression of Arel for a non Jew. It's always a Christian, Christian per se. That's, we have to look at that because that's behind the whole uh, terminology. While a Muslim will never be called a red, he will be called goy or any other kind of expression. So for him, a red is specifically. Right. So I think that that's the main point of it. That everybody knows that an red is not a Jew. That's logically what he says to this rabbi. And I find it very hard to, to decide from this last paragraph that there is a, such a popular religion or conception, unless you prove it mm -hmm. from a, a explicit source. Mm -hmm. I will uh, try to deduct from this expression that there are some people who think that if you are a, a, a conceived by a, a somebody, you know, that is, is a real, then, uh, then uh, it's a problem. You have to prove it. If there are such, mm -hmm. I don't see that this is true. I don't see it here. Because he does know, I don't see that he says he, he is, that's, that's a different issue. Uh, there is no such a notion here, in my opinion, in the text. But you might read it in, but methodologically, I think that unless you find that there are such views, or then you can uh, push the text to have it. I see it right there when you mark it. Okay, I, I mark different things. Yes. <laughs> yeah, not, but, but I see that, that he is okay. Well, uh, we are allowed right. to understand the distant things. But I think that the main point is what he is so angry about. Is there anybody who doesn't know who is an Arel? I mean, Arel is not a Jew who became Christian. Arel is a Christian, not somebody who is not circumcised. But that's a definition for somebody who is Christian and, and not the fact if he is circumcised or not. That's the way I try to understand it. That's, that's. I must tell you, being even taken going even further, because the original question was whether someone comes and says it's cocaine, it's believed or not. And I'm taking it as much, much further. So he's taking it much further. He's taking it much further. Right, right. Well, this is a recurring theme in in, in this book of responsa. Mm -hmm. the, no matter what the issue is, whether it's so-and-so claims to be a priest or um, a writ of, does a writ of divorce need to be given or um, uh, property rights, it, it all boils down to is a converso a Christian or a Jew? And so there are, and again, I, I do, even though I can't remember uh, Moshe or Fali's uh, book, I, oh, there were a number of wonderful strategies that you see plucked from halakhic literature that, you know, I, I think I can fairly say have absolutely nothing to do, did not, did not imagine in their wildest dreams that, that, that these statements could be applied in a, in a situation of conversos. I mean, there's, there are all kinds of, uh, archival literary precedents, I mean, phrases that are removed from their context, like this one, that, that serve the purpose that, that is, uh, these particular rabbis are trying to accomplish, namely to legitimate the Jewishness of conversos, even if they're not circumcised. 
Okay, to, to degrees that are very, very surprising, really. I mean, even, even when a person who has an opportunity uh, to undergo circumcision in a, uh, uh, outside the, quote, lands of idolatry, um, doesn't take advantage of that. So in other words, they are, they are perceived as quite lenient from a rabbinic perspective in legitimating and in, um, accepting con uncircumcised conversos as Jews. Okay, now we get to what I think. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's um, Well, I was, I was just going to point out uh, a similar thing that it's, it, seem, it seems like he's using this as a. The, que the question that was actually asked um, doesn't have anything to do with someone's status as a, as a Jew, as, as a Kohen. And it's sort of like he's, he's seen an ignorant question, he sees ignorance, and he's using it as an opportunity, opportunity to, to address something which may be another area of... Right. What really ticks him off is that, he, that, that this guy uses the language of conversion. He says, he calls these, these conversos, look at the word that we're using, re, so he calls that what well, conversos in the other direction, he calls the ones who re, re, return to Judaism gerim, means proselyte, like being a convert in the correct direction as opposed to an apostate. Um, and he calls the verb of their transformation is called giur. And, and that's, he finds that enormously offensive. The language is offensive because he understands that the questioner regards them as non-Jews. That's, that's the problem, or as Christians. Okay, now we get to uh, this last text, and then, then uh, I'll, we'll just, I'll be quiet. Um, Shimon ben Samach Duran, the son of the aforementioned Duran, who also wrote halachic responsa, wrote a, an anti-Christian polemic. And um, I was glad, I know Ken uh, invoked both Prophet Duran and uh, Eli Gutwirt. Um, uh, Prophet Duran, the, the 14th century, uh, early 15th century Provencal, uh, who lived as a convert, as a as a uh, non-Jew for it's for many years in the court. Um, that's a whole other matter. Um, wrote a, uh, wrote an anti-Christian polemic, Klimata Goyim, which is truly historicist in its in its um, orientation. It really contextualizes, um, tries to understand the origins of Christianity, and this is a work in that. Um, Mold, and I would be very surprised if Shimon ben Samach Duran did not know Klimat Hagoyim among other works. Okay, this is just, I think, an amazing passage. Here's, a, here's an anti Christian polemic with, which is helping Jews of his time, it's written in Hebrew, helping them understand how Christianity came into being, what Jesus was trying to do, what Paul was trying to do and the various misunderstandings that occurred notwithstanding. Okay. Are they the decades or any decades? Um, it's before that text. I mean, Shimon it's, Duran is a terrible one. Shimon ben Semach? No, this last one was Semach ben Shlomo. Anyway, what's their question? Get to them again. Early 16th century? See, you okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, but Jesus' intention, and, pl and please, you know, as those of you who are reading the Hebrew, feel free to come up with better, it's just amazing. But Jesus' intention was that the Gentiles fulfill the Noahide commandments. Everybody follow what was just said? Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus, that guy who lived in rabbinic times, who knew the seven Noahide laws as defined by the rabbis, was out to get Gentiles to abide by the seven Noahide laws, not unlike the Lubavitch of about five to ten years ago, who had their own campaign to do the same. But we can talk about that another time. And thus, they wrote that they, meaning um, the writers of the Gospels, and thus they wrote that Jesus commanded the Gentiles to undergo baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and that by means of this baptism, they would be saved after acceptance of the prohibitions against idolatry and against sexual immorality and the doctrine of free will. And in this, they, right, the writers of the New of the Gospels, relied on our rabbis of blessed memory who said, quote from the Talmud, that if one underwent circumcision but didn't undergo immersion, it is as if he was not circumcised. That's not a quote, it's a, a, a reference. Therefore, they established baptism 
right? There's the, that Tevila baptism uh, equation, which is not for the first time and not for the last time. And anthropologically, of course, everybody's happy with it. As a principle in accepting converts. And it seems that his, Jesus' intention, was to accept each as a resident alien, a ger toshav. Right? That was what Jesus was doing. He was going out among the pagans and turning them into observers of the seven Noahide laws, Gere Toshav, whom we call an uncircumcised convert. What's that? Is that Ger Arel? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Who takes upon himself the seven Noahide commandments. That which demonstrates that they only did this to attract Gentiles to their faith. So does that suggest, I mean, in other words, Jesus didn't ask too much of them. He only asked them to become Noahide, you know, the observers of Noahide laws. But they only did this to attract Gentiles to their faith. Of course, their faith was not the seven Noahide laws. It's, it's the observance of the entire Torah. Is what one of them sent in an epistle to another regarding one who had written him saying, Galatians 5.2, I so and so, it doesn't say that in Galatians, say to you that if you undergo circumcision, the Messiah will be of no avail to you. Okay, so now he's, draw okay, so he's drawing on the Pauline, you know, the, the anti-circumcision camp. Now, how would it hurt them if they were circumcised, right? Rather, he wrote this to them to reassure them lest they feel fearful because they were uncircumcised. Like, it's okay, guys, we're not asking a lot of you. Right. In other words, this whole, the, the, what we understand to be the Pauline anti-circumcision camp uh, among the early disciples is now being portrayed as a way of mollifying and reassuring f fearful Gentiles who, who unbeknownst to them are really are trying, are being lured by Jesus so that they will, alter, they will start on that track that will ultimately lead them to becoming full Jews. But don't worry, you don't have to undergo circumcision now. And this is how I understand Shimon ben Samach Duran. Again, you please help, you know, help me see it in another way. He also wrote to them, testifying to them that anyone who was circumcised is bound by the entire Torah. And in this he taught the eternality of the Torah for Israel. For inasmuch as one who is circumcised is bound by the entire Torah, he must circumcise his son in keeping with the Torah's commandment. And this will continue from son to the son's son until the end of the world. And it is also written by him, and I... Right. That and this is from Acts, and there's a long, you know, there, there's long quote um, that when one of the apostles was bound to was brought to Rome, bound in chains, he called to the Jews who were there and said to them that he had not done anything against the Jews, and that he did not differ at all with their ancestral custom. Okay, this is said about Paul. Okay, um, uh, he. So in other words, Shimon ben Samach Duran assumed that Paul had written. Um, acts, which is not what can, scholars think, but um, I'm sorry. Right, okay. He, and his time was not terrible. I was going to say, this was pretty amazing, right? He also said that the Jews of Jerusalem had not found in him anything deserving of the death penalty. That's, this is what Paul says in this passage in Acts. And had he differed with the Torah, he would have been deserving of the death penalty. Right? So this is now used, Paul's own self-defense uh, in front of the Jews of Rome, you know, I, I didn't say anything against the Torah, is now being used by Shimon ben Samach Duran uh, to, uh, as meaning that Paul never did say anything against the Torah. You know, his own, okay. Similarly, he wrote in one of his books that he believes in everything which is in the Torah, and in another place he wrote that he had not sinned against the Torah of the Jews. Okay, then there's a, a long passage um, which... I'm just going to jump into the last four lines of the indented paragraph. From Paul, right? Circumcision will indeed benefit you if you observe the Torah, but if you sin against the Torah, your circumcision will be considered uncircumcision. And if the uncircumcised one observes the covenant of the Torah, his uncircumcision will be considered as circumcision. And if, until here, Romans, I, I know you have. I think, no, it's, you know what, I have, I have a Tav Rashi and it says, I read it as Ayin Chaf Resh, but it, I think the Ayin Chaf Dalid makes more sense. He thus teaches that the Jewish people are obligated to observe the Torah, and that if even the uncircumcised observe the Torah, they are obligated to observe the Torah. And that if even the uncircumcised observe the Torah, if even the uncircumcised observe the Torah, it will be reckoned to them as if they were bound by a covenant. 
But this is only true for someone who was forcibly converted and was unable to be circumcised. Now, of course, you can understand why the same halachist, you know, you see the convergence of his halachic and his polemical uh, lines of reasoning. Or, one, or whose brothers died due to, to circumcision, or for resident aliens. This I'm a little confused about. The implication of these words is that Jesus and his students never intended to abolish the Jews' observance of the Torah. Okay, let me clear the slate now and just throw out a couple of questions. Um, if the Duran, if the Duran family was so uh, aggravated and enraged by the the fact that some Jews were calling conversos gerim. They hated that. Um, and at the same time, they are willing to call, to regard Christians, or at least the origins of Christianity, as having been a move toward a particular category of gerim at a time when, again, the term, the, the halacha category of ger toshav, of resident alien, has no valence, has no meaning, has no import unless the Jewish people are sovereign in their land. That's the halachic definition of ger toshav. So who the hell cares whether a person observes the seven Noahide laws or not? Why, why is there an interest? It's such an anachronistic concept to be trotting around in 16th and 17th century rabbinic writings. And when I when I read, I understand there's anxiety. There's anxiety about who who has the claim to being a Jew. But it's not just, you know, conversos, even those who are uncircumcised still want to be called up to the Torah as they do in Amsterdam about which Joseph Kaplan has written. It's not just that, and you can't kick them out because they contribute financially to the maintenance of the community. And everybody knows that they're, you know, that they refuse to undergo circumcision and continue to have these synagogue honors. So there's, there's that kind of confused identity. But my suggestion is there's also something going on because they know of Christians who are doing just about everything but undergoing circumcision. I, I mean, I, maybe I'm, re, I'm, I'm trying to connect you know, two mysteries that intrigue me and wondering whether there is something live here, whether there's a live connection. Two okay. minutes. Except for the last line, I think this is amazingly... Sustainable, uh, sustainable interpretation of Paul. Uh, I don't think Paul meant this. <laughs> no, but it could be you could read it this way because Paul is very clear. You know, if, 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 if you're not circumcised, you know, if you're circumcised, you're subject to take on all the meat so He thinks it's a disaster because you won't be saved. It's not like your faith. No, so that's the John Gager way of reading Paul, and I think that I, I think that's perfectly correct. Yeah. That Paul said one thing to the Jews and one thing to the Greeks. I well, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. And that is in terms of the author of this particular text. And, and it strikes me that in a certain way, he, regardless of what the real truth is, he is trying to, to, to go at the, um, uh, at the at the Christianity this way, and at the same time to do all these other things. In other words, I think there's a third level to, to all this, and it's in the, in the Christianity, as the Christians understand it, is a perversion of Christian origin. Right. right. And that therefore, once we do that, then we can accept all these people. And right. then finally, I just remind of those texts, the, these crazy texts of Sixtus the Fourth that I mentioned this morning, which we which suggest a situation in which what's, what we're describing here as potentially, possibly, is the real thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, 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 that I think there's a reality behind this. Direct I, I, I just want to reaffirm what you said. Um, the Jewish reclamation of Jesus and Christian origins uh, as having uh, Jesus as a good, kosher Jewish boy had happened earlier, and starting with Prophet Duran and continuing through through uh, Magen Vakeshet, through Magen Vacherev of Yud Arimot, and now we see a, a historicist attempt to understand the origins of Christianity in a way that does tend, on the whole, to explain away all these problems as people's misunderstandings. 
it wasn't supposed to be this way. Nobody was really ill-intentioned. It was human error. And, and also, there's a little more to it than that. But, but it is about reclaiming Christian origins so that they, you know, it's no longer... Uh, I mean, it's still an anti-Christian polemic, but there's an awful lot of sympathetic historical contextualization. Okay. Uh, would, would you see, um, going back to the Modena... One minute. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, an attempt to, to talk about a universalist basis. How do we reject all three of the old three monotheistic things? Okay. Uh, See, I, I don't, I, I, I can't, I'm not that progressive in my thinking. I, that's one of the reasons that I always say Kol Sachal and never say Modena. Because I don't think Modena really thought that, you know, Kumbaya and, you know, that's, that's all. Uh, but I think that he was genuinely this guy who was, who corresponded with Christian Hebraists, who, who, I mean, Paolo Sarpi, the, the, um, I'm blocking on all, on his, uh, Venetian, I forgot if, what, what kind of friar he was. He was brought before the Inquisition because he hung around with Jews and had annotations in his own Hebrew Tanakh. And, you know, so much interesting stuff is going on. There are Jews and Christian, Jewish and Christian intellectuals who are buddies, I'm, I feel quite certain of it, who are interested in one another's thinking about things. Um, when you think of, and I'm jumping back 50 years, if not more, to um, the Heptaplomeres of, of, of Jean Baudet, I mean, you know, boy, the Jew looks pretty darn good there, though. You can't, I mean, people are talking. I mean, humanists are talking, jurists are talking. Certainly, uh, among the intellectuals, Jews and Christians, I'm not saying amcha, right? But people are talking, and, and, and prominent Christians are changing their faith in ways that Jews are seeing. And how are they processing it? They are talking. I'm sure they're talking to them. Did they ever think that they were going to... Um, that they were going to pare down Judaism so that it would actually be acceptable? No, I don't think so at all, but I think that theologically they were making peace with them so that they could say, we don't live in a world of strife, we live in a world in which you are Gerei Toshav and God shines his light upon you as well. Um, I don't think, I think Modena was too much of a pragmatist. There were some eschatologically oriented people like beginning with Sforno in Rome in 1500 who, for eschatological reasons, and some Kabbalists who I think are also revising their conceptions of Christianity, but it's because they think they will convert at the end of days. Do I think Modena thought that? I don't know. The guy's too, he's too, he's too much of a realist. Thank you.